All right, let's start back into, uh, into James. We, we're chatting beforehand just on, you know, just the state of how things are in the world, how we are with people, and I do find it extraordinary, the opportunity and the responsibility that God puts in front of us. The height to which he calls us, and the great need to bring that beauty to the world, where it so sorely lacks it. And sometimes I'm, I'm a little concerned that we as Christians often build a Christianity that's really built on nothing more than our presuppositions about what Christianity is. And often that's because we haven't even cracked the book to see, well, what is the plan? What is the idea? What is it about? Or sometimes if we do crack the book, our ignorance about what's in it overtakes us and we wind up replacing the emptiness with more of those presuppositions. And sadly, sometimes we're also not taught of what's in that book and what the plan is about. And so we build up this, this Christianity that kind of is either equated, equated with a, a pile of rules that we have to keep or it's a, equated with be a good person until it's not convenient and then don't worry about it because you're a good person anyway because you're a Christian. And not, neither of those work very, very well. So we'll see a little bit of that tonight as we go through the third chapter of Giant James and this importance of teaching, of wisdom, of what we need to learn to understand what is the greatness of our calling, the heights to which we're called, and how much we need to change, no matter how good we think we are or how long we've been doing this, how much we need to continue that change because we are called to something unfathomably beautiful. And we start usually in some place that's unfathomably unbeautiful, to put it politely. But God has promised, so, so it will be. So with that, let's turn to him and ask him to make us beautiful tonight, or at least a little more beautiful. Our truly beautiful God, how we wait for the day when we can stand and see and begin to really comprehend your beauty in all of its greatness. I don't know that we ever will. But I know certainly I have a long way to go, and even just the little I see is still so, so thrilling. So we ask tonight that you help us to grow, to see, to understand, and to be, to be ever closer to you, to fall more deeply in love with you, and to be molded into your image that we can show your beauty to the world. So bless us now. Again, Holy Spirit, come and inspire whomever, speak through whomever, and bless not only what is said, but perhaps even more importantly, what is heard. So we pray these things through Jesus Christ, beauty in the flesh, who has come to save us. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so 2 James 3. And as always, we'll take our tour through the chapter from top to bottom before we dive into it verse by verse. As you've been reading, I, I always do want to pause at the beginning. Thoughts, ideas, questions, things you came across in James or any place else you'd like to talk about before we begin. All right, so James 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you realize that we will be judged more strictly, for we all fall short in many respects. If anyone does not fall short in speech, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body also. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we also guide their whole bodies. In the same, it is the same with ships. Even though they are so huge and driven by fierce winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot's inclination wishes. In the same way, the tongue is a small member and yet has great pretensions. Consider how small a fire can set a huge forest ablaze. The tongue is also a fire. It exists among our members as a world of malice, defiling the whole body and setting the entire course of our lives on fire, itself set on fire by Gehenna. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. 
This need not be so, my brothers. Does a spring gush forth from the same opening, both pure and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, produce olives or a grapevine figs? Neither can salt water yield fresh. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show his works by his, let him show his works by a good life and the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. Wisdom of this kind does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every foul practice. But the wisdom from above is first of all pure, then peaceable, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, without inconstancy or insincerity. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace for those who cultivate peace. So there we have James 3. Any thoughts before we hop right into the verse by verse? All right, so we'll start in verse 1, a verse that uh, obviously makes my hair stand on edge and sends shivers down my spine for what it says about us. Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, for you know that we who teach shall be judged with greater strictness. So quite a bit in here. As we pull this apart, in the time in which James is writing, in the early church, it's quite possible that teacher was an official role in the church, not just someone who would, who would get up and teach, but actually something quite official. We can see this in a few places. Let's go over to Ephesians 4 and verse 11. In fact, today was the feast of St. Matthew in the Catholic liturgy, and so we came across a couple of the scriptures we'll reference today. And his gifts were that some should be apostles, right, there's an office, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. So we'll see that it's not quite so hard and fast, but it very well may be an office. We see it in Acts 13 and verse 1. This is in the church of Antioch before Paul and Barnabas are set aside for the missionary journey. It's actually when they're being set aside. And it describes what's going on in the church. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Okay, prophets and teachers. And then we'll look at 1 Corinthians 12, in verse 28. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, then healers, helpers, administrators, speakers in various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? but earnestly desire the higher gifts. So he's talking about how each of us have our own gifts to serve the body of Christ. Is it official? Is it not? A little hard to say. Some of the scriptures make it seem official, but if you look at some of this apostles, that's, that's pretty official. Right? But on the other hand, you, know, you don't sign up for the working of the miracles or the, or the healing ministry. You know, that, that's a gift that God gives us, you know, or, or tongues. Uh, so whether it's official or not, but there seems to be some indication that there were people who were known as teachers in the community, in the church. We also can see in the scriptures sound precedent for the idea that, you know, if you remember, you know, Spider-Man, you know, with, with great power comes great responsibility. And we, we, we see that uh, in the scriptures itself. In fact, let's take a look at Leviticus 4. And we'll see how those who have been given more responsibility are held to greater accountability. So in Leviticus 4, we have some commandments about sin offerings. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, 
If anyone sins unwittingly in any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done, and does any one of them, if it is anointed, if it, if it is the anointed priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people, then let him offer for the sin which he has committed a young bull without blemish to the Lord for a sin offering. Okay, so if you're a priest and you, you mess up, you don't realize it, but then you come back and you see, oh yeah, I, I did mess up, I sinned. I repent of my sin. I now need a sin offering. It was a bull. Pretty expensive offering. We'll drop down a little further to... Uh, well, actually, you know what? I, I do want to go on a little further. Just not that it's, it's a little off the topic, but it clears up something important in Scripture for us. So he has to bring this bull. And in verse 4, He shall bring the bull to the door of the tent of meeting before the Lord and lay his hand on the head of the bull, and kill the bull before the Lord. And the anointed priest shall take some of the blood of the bull, and bring it to the tent of meeting. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood, and sprinkle part of the blood seven times before the Lord, in front of the veil of the sanctuary. Right, seven times is this number of completeness, a very important number in the Bible. The priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrant incense. Typically on, on, on the altars there would be these four you know, things that just stick up. Uh, they would call them the horns of the altar. And so he puts a little bit of blood on the horns of the altar. Of the altar of fragrant incense before the Lord, which is in the tent of meeting. And the rest of the blood of the bull he shall pour out at the base of the altar a burnt offering, which is at the door of the tent of meeting. So he takes the rest of the blood, pours it out, a libation, we see that term elsewhere. You know, and he pours it out at the base of the altar. We think, so what? Isn't all this stuff done away? Why do I even have to read these books of the Bible? Um, does scripture ring a bell for anyone from the New Testament? Pouring out the blood of the bulls underneath the altar? Let's go to Revelation 6. And verse 9. These are the, the seven seals. So towards the beginning, beginning of the book, there's a scroll that's given. No one can open the scroll except the lamb who was slain. He's worthy to open the, the book. And this has these seven seals he's breaking off. And this is the fifth seal. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. Why are they under the altar? They have been slain. They have been poured out as a libation, as an offering. Okay, so we, we see all this imagery that comes from the sacrificial law of the Old Testament finds its way into the New Testament with a great meaning. So here's why the, the souls are under the altar in this, this vision. But back to Leviticus 4. So the priest who sins offers a bull. Let's go down. I think I wanted to go to verse 22. <clears throat> now, when a ruler sins, doing unwittingly any one of all the things which the Lord his God has commanded not to be done, and is guilty, if the sin which he has committed is made known to him, he shall bring as his offering a goat, a male without blemish. Why? The priest is the pinnacle. It's what, what the people are supposed to look to for their spiritual instruction. If he messes up, it's a bull. Well, the ruler is still important, but if he messes up, it's a male goat. And then a little further down, if any one of the common people sins unwittingly in doing any one of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done and is guilty, when the sin which he has committed is made known to him, he shall bring for his offering a goat, a female, without blemish. Okay, so we kind of go down the, the, the pecking order here, at least as one would organize these animals. You know, the greater the spiritual responsibility, the greater the offering for sin. We see Jesus taking the task, those who were supposed to be examples, as falling under great condemnation when they fell in being that example. Let's look at, uh, at Luke 20, verses 46 and 47. And again, learning our way around the Bible, these are the kind of scriptures that as you're studying your Bible, you would put in your margin. Or if you're using a Bible study software, you, you'd have them. Well, as you can see, the margin, well, I don't have them on my margin here. But you can stick them in your margin so you have all of these cross-references. So when you read your Bible, you can get a, an idea of how this topic is spread across the Bible. And here Jesus says, beware of the scribes. You're supposed to be experts in the law. 
Right? Beware of the scribes who like to go about in long robes and love salutations in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. I also have here, just for your notes, Mark 12, 38 to 40, the same thing. Let's go to Matthew 5 and 19. Again, remember the topic here is teaching. Whoever then, well, let's go up, let's get a little context. Let's go one verse up. This is, as, as I say, kind of the whole specific purpose statement of the, of the Sermon on the Mount. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But he who does them and teaches them, and we'll come back to this does and teaches in a little while, does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so we have those who teach us very poorly, we have those who teach us very well. And there is a consequence. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's how we said the whole Sermon on the Mount seems to be illustrating the difference between the righteousness we're supposed to have and the problem with the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, so we have teachers, those who are supposed to teach us, and they are subject to greater judgment, bear greater responsibility, will be judged more harshly, or more strictly, we might say. So I want to take a moment and talk about teachers, talk about teachers in the church, talk about our, our pastors, those who minister to us, our responsibilities to them, their responsibilities to us, and how to deal with good ones and bad ones. It's an important topic in all of our churches. First, take, let's take a quick look at our responsibility to those who have been entrusted to teach us. Let's go to Hebrews 13 and verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as men who will have to give account Okay, so those who have been entrusted to teach us, you know, our pastors, our ministers, they've got to give account for what they do. You know, some of them have a lot to account for. Some of them are just wonderful lights and assets and blessings upon the church. Okay, but obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as men who will have to give account. Let them do this joyfully and not sadly, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, again, I should be quick to point out, there's a context here. There's an assumption that these are teachers who are legitimate, who are good. If our teachers are telling us to do things that are blatantly sinful, no, don't submit to them, <laughs> don't obey them. Okay, we need to call them out on such things. Yeah. This, is, this, is the, this is the hand of God, this is the body of Christ, so indeed we should go to bed together. No, as has sadly happened. Yeah. No. That's not what we're talking about here, okay? But on the other hand, remember that our leaders are human. I don't mean that as an excuse at all. I mean that as helping to explain that last sentence. You know, if we are just so awful and miserable and terrible to our leaders, kind of, you know, they feel it. They get downtrodden, they get discouraged, and they're not able to lead us and teach us as effectively because they just feel like every time they walk in the room, they're gonna get shot at. So it's, it helps us to help them as we work with them. Yeah, there might be problems. We might need to address those problems. We might need to bring those problems to their attention. But let's work together in the process. Comment, let's get a mic, mic over to, uh, to Celia. But here's, here's his point. Submit to them, they have to give account. They're responsible for what they tell you. And let them do this joyfully, not sadly, for that would be of no advantage to you. Celia? 
Was this the beginning of what you would call the magisterium as the charism of teaching in the church? Yes, this is very true. In fact, we're going to talk a lot about that. That's why I want to spend some time on teaching, because there is that authority to teach in the church. And there are mechanisms for dealing with what happens in the church in its teaching office. So we, we do have this responsibility to work with the process. You know, it doesn't help anyone to tear it all down. Now, if we do have someone who really is a problem, and we'll, we'll bring up examples of teachers who are problems, you know, we do have to do something about it. But let's try to make things work. Let's take a look at an example of this need to give account and of things not always going well in the church. <laughs> Where might we go for that, 1 Corinthians? You know, classic church that's in a whole pile of trouble. 1 Corinthians 3. And we'll see both sides. We'll see problems here with the people in the assembly, and we'll see problems, or potential problems, with the teachers. Here Paul is speaking to this church that's so troubled. It's got, remember, it's got all kinds of things going on. It has sexual problems going on. They're dragging each other into court. They're arguing. There are divisions. There's fighting. There's just all kinds of stuff going on in Corinth. And he says, But I, brethren, could not address you as spiritual men, but as men of the flesh, as babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even yet you're not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For a while there is jealousy and strife among you. Are you not of the flesh and behaving like ordinary men? That's enough to make me cry. To think that sometimes indeed in the church we're supposed to be the light of the world. We're supposed to show the beauty of God. And sometimes we are the worst out there. That we're just like ordinary men. He's talking to the church. He's not talking to the outsiders. He's talking to one of the biggest churches. Or the one where God said, I've got a lot of people in the city. Don't worry, stay here. And he's talking to them and saying, look, you're, you're, you're no better than everybody else. You're behaving, and we're not talking about your inherent worth. You know, of course we're no better than anyone else. But even in what you're doing, you're no better than anyone else. You're behaving like ordinary men. And this is a bit of what I meant by the, the, those opening comments about we're called to such greatness, but we don't even realize what it is. Remember last week, I, I put it up again. I, I showed that, uh, that kind of that growth stack, as I called it. And... As I say, what, what happens is so often we make that first step, which is really good, which is really, really important. And we get out of this unbelief, we get out of this mechanical Christianity, we build up this relational Christianity, but we stop there. And we start reading our Bibles all with presuppositions and don't really read what it says. We don't move on. And as a result, all that the world sees is this very, very immature level of Christianity that tends to be deeply selfish because it's coming out of selfishness. It's all about Jesus and me. It's all about my salvation. It's all about the rush I'm getting by being a Christian. Maybe I'm getting puffed up by my righteousness. It can be any number of things. It's a start. But if we stay here, we're not really showing the world what the product's supposed to look like. And if we're just self-satisfied and we just look like everybody else, who are we fooling? And it's not a matter... It, 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 look at the signs. They say self-deception is so powerful. How do you cut through self-deception? You look at the fruits. Look at what he's saying here. For you are still of the flesh, for while there is jealousy and strife... Sound like what we read at the end of James 3? We're going to get there in James 3 as well. Where there's jealousy, where there's strife, where there's fighting, where there's all these things we've been reading about. Look at the fruits. If that's in our lives, who are we kidding? You might have been doing this, walking this way for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. Maybe we're here when the parish founded or you were a founding member of the church where you attend. But if there's still strife and there's still jealousy and there's still fighting and there's still upset, what fruits are those? We're behaving like ordinary men. And now we see how they, they were fighting over the teachers. And he gives an example of this. Divisions. For when one says, I belong to Paul, 
and another, oh, I belong to pa pa Apollos. Are you not merely men? Well, wait a second, of course we're men, right? Or women. Aren't we called to be divine? Partakers of the divine nature? To have the life of Jesus Christ in us? Instead, we're merely men when we're doing this. And now he gets into the teachers. Apollos was a great teacher. Apollos and Paul didn't have a problem. They were on the same page. It was the people who were saying, I'm Apollos, oh, I'm Paul, oh, I'm Cephas, oh, I got you all, I'm Jesus. <laughs> I'm, I'm in his party. Really? And he says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, right, Paul founded the church in Corinth. I planted, Apollos watered. He came and he taught. But God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. You know, it's not pastor so-and-so's church. It's not Monsignor so-and-so's church. It's not anybody's church, but God's church. It's God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who has waters are equal. And each shall receive his wages according to his labor. And here he starts getting into the accountability of the teachers. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And another man is building upon it. And now he turns his attention to the teachers. Let each man take care how he builds upon it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We'll come to that, that later, too, when we talk about teachers who don't teach as they should. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, okay, we have good teachers who build valuable and beautiful things, and we have teachers who don't do so well. Don't bring us towards the eternity. Don't prepare us for the life that we're really supposed to live, who sell us short in what God has called us for. Each man's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. We all face that day. Right? Because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Are our teachers preparing us for the trials we face, for the judgment we face? Are they forming us into the image of Christ, or are they forming us into somebody's preposition about what good people are supposed to be like? So there is accountability for those who are entrusted to teach us. Let's take some more look at, at our teachers, what they're supposed to be like, what our responsibilities are with them. Let's go to Titus 1 and verse 7. Most translations translate this word literally. Revised Standard doesn't, so I'm, I'm going to these first. If we look at, say, that uh, New American Standard Bible on the top right. For the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward. Overseer. The word in the Greek is, as you'll see in your notes, epi skopos. Epi, over, like epicenter is over the, over the center of where an earthquake is, right? Epi is over. Skopos, like telescope, microscope. Right? Episkopos. 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 Does that sound familiar to anyone? Who is an overseer? Who is an, an episcopos? The bishop. Right? The bishop. We believe in the ep 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 episcopacy. Okay? So the overseer is the bishop. So if we come back to the Revised Standard Version. For a bishop, as God's steward, must be blameless. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of goodness, master of himself, upright, holy, and self-controlled. 
He must hold firm to the sure word as taught. We'll come back to that phrase too. He must hold firm to the sure word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to confute those who contradict it. For there are many insubordinate men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially the circumcision party. They must be silent since they're upsetting whole families by teaching for base gain what they have no right to teach. So there are teachers who are teaching wrong things and don't have the right to teach it. Kind of the, the Celia's point earlier. So the role of this teacher, this one who is the overseer, is to teach as he has been taught. A really important point. Let's take a quick look over in Proverbs 30 and verse 6. This isn't just something new. Again, something I ask myself all the time as we do these studies. It's not that I'm, I'm an overseer, not, I'm not even an official teacher. I'm just the guy who put up his hand and said, I'll do it. <laughs> don't throw me out. Yeah. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Okay? When teaching, are we teaching what God says? Or are we just teaching our own thoughts, our own minds, and if we are, and it's not what God says, it's not the truth. We're a liar. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. When teaching, there is a specific goal in mind. You know, this teaching isn't just knowledge. This teaching this teaching has an important goal which cannot be overlooked because if we're not teaching to the goal, the teaching is useless. I'll digress just a little bit. I've been reading an interesting book. This is, um, this is Welcome to the Secular Order of Discalced Carmelites. You know, it's about discerning calling to, to the secular Carmelites. As I mentioned, you know, our call to holiness is not limited to monks and nuns. Right? We, don't, we don't say, I don't want to be that holy. Right? How holy do you want to be? No that it's for everybody. And so these lay communities, Franciscans, Dominicans, Oblates of Benedictines, you know, uh, Carmelites, are all to help us to, to go as far as we're supposed to go, to really come out of this world and have the support of community and take up that charism to be to the world. And there were three things that really, really just jumped out at me as I read this, this short book, three very valuable points. And two of them are pertinent to our discussion. One is he makes the distinction between information and formation. There's a big difference between the two. And he's talking about, of course, in, in, the, in the orders, we're supposed to engage in formation, forming people into Carmelites or Franciscans. And indeed, in the church, our whole mission as church, as leaders of the church, is to form people into the image of Christ. Right? That's what those gifts are for. Until we all come to the stature of the fullness of Christ. We're to be formed into Christ. So we undergo formation. And that's different than information. And so information is just the facts. And all, if all we do is dump facts into people's heads as our, our role in the church, that's not enough. Information is not enough. Right? That was all of James 2. Faith without works. If all you do is know, if all you do is believe, you know, it has to take root. It has to be real. And that formation happens when we illustrate how to use this knowledge. Why is so important that the Episcopus be a holy person? Not given to drunkenness, not given to greed, not be given to contention, but someone who sets that example. You know, if you think about it, we don't have a whole lot of the teachings of Jesus. We've got a few hours. I would venture a guess that the apostles learned far more from Jesus by walking with him and eating with them and sleeping with them and going to the wedding with them and going fishing with them and going here and there with him and watching how he lived than they learned by just the information alone. Jesus formed them not just informed them. 
And the important thing is, again, we're speaking about teaching in an official capacity, but we ourselves are all called to evangelize the world, aren't we? And in that role, in our partaking of the apostolate, our partaking of going out and proclaiming the gospel to all, and use words if you have to, is not just the communication of information, it's the formation. And to do that, we must be holy. We must be like God. And that's a great difference than just knowing. And the second point was related. He was, and this was specifically, he was talking about the charism of, of the Carmelite community. The point was interesting, that the most important charism of the Carmelite community is to know God in order to make him known. To know God in order to make him known. And this is why I started with that idea of presuppositions, why I've gone to that chart about these levels of Christianity. Now, if all we know about God is that we have these presuppositions that he's a nice guy and we're a nice guy and as long as we don't cross him, he won't zot us. If, if all we know about God is we go to church on Sunday or on Saturday, and maybe we spend 10 minutes praying in the car on the way to work to him, if that. Do we really know God? And if we don't know him, how can we make him known? So if we really want to take on the task that Jesus has given us to go out into the world and be its light, to go out into the world and make it a better place, to go out into the world and bring salvation to others, not by clobbering them over the head with our words, but by forming them with our lives and our examples and the way we live, if we don't know God, how can we make him known? And you can't get to know God if all you do is show up to church to do your duty on Sunday and maybe, if you're lucky, pray 10 minutes while rushing in the car. If we're not taking that time to learn of his word, if we're not taking that time to live in his grace, if we're not taking that time to pray with him and not just say words, but really pray with him, share with him, be intimate with him, and listen to him in the silence, that's how we get to know God. And it's only once we know God that we can make him known. If we're sitting way down here in relational Christianity, we don't know much about God. But this is what most people see when they see Christians. So can we see why it's so important, why I keep coming back and saying, know what the plan is, know how far it is. If we knew how far we had to go, we'd be running as hard as we could. Not just for our sakes, forget about our salvation. Forget about our salvation. Think about how do I bring joy and wonder to the God I love. And now that I've come to know him, not to get my salvation, but to give him joy, now that I know him, I can make him known. And this happens, unfortunately, with teachers. So often I've seen we start with the zeal. And often there is a lot of zeal in this relational Christianity, right? Our lives have turned around. We've, we've stopped cheating on our wives. We've we, we become you know, clean citizens. We've we stopped drinking. We've stopped doing all kinds of terrible things. And we're enthusiastic. And that's good we want to tell the world. But then we go out in this sophomoric enthusiasm, not really well formed ourselves, and we start spitting out these very distorted views of God. I believe, oh, I always mangled a guy's name. Pacominius? Most people don't hear of St. Pachomenius. You hear of St. Anthony of the Desert as the founder of monasticism. But really, it was actually St. Pachomenius. And this guy's out in the desert for 15 years, and they want to bring him back as bishop, and he says, I'm not ready yet. Because he realized how much further he had to go to know God in order to make him known. You know, and so really, we need to be formed. We need... Oops. Oh, what happened there? We, we need to be formed and take the time to be formed in order to make God known. That's a good point to stop and think about over, over a little break. And then we'll come back and I'll figure out what happened here and we'll, uh, we'll come back to the rest of this scripture.